Well, hello friends and welcome to Ask Zach. Today we're gonna have a fun topic uh, that came up because one of my Patreon followers asked about it. And so he had bought an instrument that a dealer had said had been owned by a guitar celebrity. And uh, we did some digging and found out that there was no connection. And he asked that I uh, do a video about this. And I agreed because I've actually run into this situation a lot because I, during my time writing for Vintage Guitar Magazine, I would get a lot of requests for verifying uh, celebrity connections with instruments. And unfortunately, it was always after the fact, after they had bought it. So uh, I call these ghost stories. And it seems like so many vintage guitars have a ghost story about some, you know, famous connection that's most of the time, I would say 98% of the time, completely unverifiable. So we're going to talk about that. And we're going to bring back uh, the book nook segment. And uh, I'm going to talk about a book that I love, that I've uh, learned a lot about guitar setup from. And then I'm going to talk about a book that's currently in bookstores that I think you should avoid at all costs. And uh, then uh, another book on that same topic that you should dig up if you're wanting to uh, learn more about this uh, musical artist. All right. So first off, I need to thank today's sponsor, which is Glazer Instruments and their sister companies, Glazer Bender and Music City Bridge. I have, of course, been a customer of Glazer Instruments for 30 plus years. They have refretted or done plec work or done all sorts of repairs and have worked on almost every instrument that I have. Glazer Bender makes the wonderful convertible bender that can be changed between a B or G bender. And I have those on two of my guitars. It's the finest bender system available currently. And uh, it's, uh, it can be installed fairly quickly too. It doesn't have the lead times that the old benders uh, used to have. And finally, Music City Bridge makes some of the finest tools and, uh, you know, and parts for your guitars. So they have everything from like these, this uh, driver set that I use when setting up my instruments to they have a, a wraparound intonated bridge for Les Paul Juniors. They have locking studs for those uh, bridges. They make a wonderful three pickup blend control harness that you can purchase from them. And also they have things for working on the frets on your guitar, also things for repairing the nut. And so there are links in the description for all of those. Also, I just want to thank my Patreon followers, that uh, supporters that are, are just invaluable to me. All right, let's dive in. So again, uh, this all got started because one of my Patreon followers, he had been sold an instrument and he had been told that it had a celebrity connection. And there was even a letter of authenticity that was by an unscrupulous dealer where it had no proof of any kind, but it just claimed a connection to this artist. And when we uh, did some digging, we found out that there was no connection and that this artist really uh, doesn't sell uh, their guitars or give them away. And so that was kind of a, another telltale sign. So I've run into this a lot through the years and I started running into it in, uh, you know, when I started writing for Vintage Guitar Magazine over 15 years ago, guys would send me pictures of guitars and it would be, you know, I mean, one example was a guy sent me a picture of a 60s Telecaster and he said, uh, when I bought this, I was told that uh, it was formerly owned by Joe Walsh. Well, I was just naive and stupid enough to go, uh, you know, about trying to track down Joe Walsh and get an answer. And so, of course, I did a lot of legwork and we were finally able to get in touch with Joe Walsh and then come to find out there was no connection at all. 
And so then I'm left with uh, something that no one really wants um, to be broadcast you know, in a magazine, uh, the fact that they bought an instrument that does not have a connection with uh, an artist and that they were told it was. And, um, you know, and I had that happen many times until finally I stopped being involved with that because 90% of the time it's just untrue. And it's just, I don't know whether it's, um, you know, just so a romanticized, you know, vision or, or what it is or, or something hopeful that they think it would be nice if it had that that connection with a celebrity. And I get it because we like to have a story. Stories sell things. I mean, think about the old story of the used car salesman. And, you know, he's selling a car to someone. And the big story is it was owned by a little old lady and she just drove it to church in the store, you know, twice a week. And, you know, it's basically saying this car was really taken care of, low mileage, blah, blah, blah. And we like stories. So if, if you're buying some, uh, you know, a used guitar, what helps sell it better than, you know, I mean, because one, you could put it out as, you know, hey, this is a used Telecaster. But if you say, hey, this is a used Telecaster and it's owned by Joe Walsh. Well, then all of a sudden it has a story and it has a premium that the dealer can put on the price. And a lot of unscrupulous dealers, you know, through the years have done that. And I think um, more recently it's become less common. You will still see that some on the individual level. But the purpose of this video is really to tell you that you need to really have a jaundiced eye when anyone has, when anyone claims a celebrity connection and that you really need to have concrete proof. So here, here are some things you should look for. One, uh, if the, uh, you know, if the instrument is being sold, you know, you should probably try to find from a, a reputable dealer. Uh, and then that dealer should have some type of real uh, certificate of authenticity and usually a picture of that artist with the instrument. Now, if it's after they've passed away and it was one that they used on stage, well, great, have a picture where it's verifiable, you know, where like the grain of, of you know, hopefully there's some type of grain or finish or some way where you can verify it's the same instrument uh, in, the, in the old photo, but uh, there should be something from the estate of the deceased artist. So, uh, you know, there have been, you know, older, uh, you know, session players and such that uh, their instruments have been sold off at uh, Groon Guitars or Carter Vintage, who are both, of course, very reputable uh, dealers here in Nashville. And they come with, you know, because many times they don't have a photo with the, uh, with the deceased guitarist, but they have a letter of authenticity that's from the estate of the guitarist, usually their uh, widow or a family member. And so that's enough. Um, yeah. So I, I think in saying this, I know that we all like to have a, a, a storied connection. And we like to have a story with a guitar because it makes it more fun because, you know, these are not living things. I mean, they once were, you know, they once were, you know, trees. Uh, but, you know, we like to uh, attach these stories and we like to romanticize and, uh, you know, and, and so many times there isn't, you know, some amazing story about a vintage guitar. So this is my 57 Esquire. And, you know, I bought it a couple of years ago down in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And I bought it during the middle of the pandemic. And so it wasn't kind of your normal kind of shopping for a vintage guitar. I mean, I went, I drove down there specifically to look at this guitar. And uh, so there wasn't, it wasn't like I was just that down there to shop, but still, because, you know, you're wearing masks and all that junk, uh, you know, I wasn't really messing around. And once I decided to buy it, you know, I paid for it and I left. 
And it wasn't until I got home, and I think Dan Strain asked me you know, this. He said, hey, is there any story associated with the guitar? Because that's a common question. You know, when you buy a vintage guitar, and this one had been spray painted blue, and it was rattle can blue, and it was, uh, and the guy, you know, was serious enough that he removed all the blonde finish, put a red sealer coat, and then put this blue finish on top. So, and it, you know, the neck was played to death. The frets were gone. And, you know, I've added some wear to this, but most of this wear was on the guitar, you know, when I got it. So immediately, you know, I mean, yeah, Dan Strain said, hey, is there a story behind the guitar? I mean, and it didn't, it didn't have to be a celebrity connection. It would be like, uh, oh, you know, yeah, this, uh, this hillbilly cat played, you know, country music in the bars around Tuscaloosa, you know, for years, or, you know, blues guitarist or what have you, or reggae, what have you. I mean, still it, it you know, there was that desire for a story. And immediately I thought, I'm such an idiot. I need to reach out to the dealer and, uh, and find out, you know, find the story out. Well, I contacted the dealer, Guitar Gallery down in Tuscaloosa, and they said, well, there's a, there, there is a story, but uh, I need permission to tell it. And so I got really excited then. Well, when uh, they ended up telling me that once they got permission from the family that sold it was that basically the guitar had been lost in a poker game. So they hadn't, and then the owner, the guy that won it in the poker game didn't play guitar and it sat in a closet. So that was, that was all the story they knew. Everyone was dead. So, you know, it was, it was a, a complete dead end. It's kind of a, it is a fun story in that you're able to say, hey, this guitar was lost in a poker game. And that's kind of fun. But, uh, but there's no information about who owned it before or, you know, where it was used or what kind of music was played on it. I mean, it, it, I'm just, I'm still curious, you know, because of, uh, you know, the wear up and down the neck and the fact that the frets were completely worn out. Um, yeah, it seemed like it would have had a, a good story, but uh, I don't, uh, unfortunately, I don't get the privilege of having the story of this guitar. And so, you know, it's, uh, it's getting its own story at this point. I guess we have blank pages for the first, you know, chapters. And then, of course, you know, this has been my main guitar for the last couple of years since I got it. So, be very careful when you're uh, buying guitars and don't allow anyone to inflate the value of a guitar based on an alleged celebrity connection. There needs to be verifiable information. There needs to be a letter of authenticity from a reputable dealer it, and they still need to have proof. There needs to be proof. There needs to be a photo of the artist with the guitar, something from the estate, something from the family. And uh, yeah, it just, there's just too many things being sold as Jimi Hendrix wah wah pedal or, you know, where it's like, well, how are you gonna, you know, did this come from the family? You know, where is this coming from? Oh, well, it's some guy that, you know, happened to be at a show in the 60s. Okay, well, where's the, where's the verification? Or, you know, proving something like, uh, you know, this was, uh, you know, Steve Ray Vaughn's, you know, TS-808 or something like that. Well, it's like, how are you going to prove it? You know, do you have serial numbers off of a you know, receipt from Sam Ash or something like that? You need to prove these things before you can attach some, you know, in, and usually it's some type of incredible value um, on something. I will say there was one case where... In, uh, in these requests that people have made of me to help verify an instrument. And that was, there was a, an Orville 335 made in the 1980s that was left-handed that was uh, owned, that the, the owner uh, claimed it was owned by Elliot Easton of the cars. And so I was able to reach out to Elliot Easton and he said, as far as I can remember, I think that was my guitar for a while. 
And uh, I mean, he couldn't say it beyond a shadow of a doubt, but he could say at least, I think that was my guitar. So, you know, you could kind of add that to it. So be careful. Um, yeah, and, and, and if, you're, if you have an instrument like that, you know, let's not tell the story if, uh, if you can't prove anything because it still is kind of used as a, uh, a tool to negotiate with. And no one wants to sit on a throne of lies when talking about guitars. All right, let's talk, uh, let's go into the book nook segment. So I love this book. And this has been a really important book for me, learning about guitar setup and guitar maintenance. It's called How to Make Your Electric Guitar Play Great by Dan Erlewin. And uh, of course, published by uh, Backbeat, which I think is an imprint of, uh, which I believe is an imprint of Hal Leonard. This is a fantastic book um, and very much worth picking up. I, ha I learned so much about uh, you know, about relief and intonation and all sorts of things. Uh, it's a it's a fantastic book, and uh, I'll put a uh, a link down in the description for this. Now, for a uh, a less than stellar review, I'm going to uh, talk about another book. So I was at the uh, local Barnes and Noble, and I picked up this book. And I was aghast at the number of historical inaccuracies that were in this book. And so I'm going to tell you about this book just so you know to steer clear of this. Because if you go into a Barnes and Noble or most you know, major bookstores, it will be there in the uh, music biography sections. And this is The Hag by Mark Elliott. This is a terrible book. There are probably nuggets of truth in here. There are probably interviews that are accurate but there are so many inaccuracies as far as just even basic things where he talks about Johnny Cash being married to June Carter in 1960 or talking about Clive Davis being the head of Columbia in the 1980s when he was fired in the 70s and was the head of Arista through the late 70s and 80s and onward and was helming like the careers of Whitney Houston and others. Um, giving uh, Mark Kendrick, the great builder, uh, credit for, for building the guitar that, uh, you know, that, that Merle played in, in the 1980s, which was made by Jerry Jones. And it wasn't until into the 90s that it just goes on and on and on. It seems like every other page and uh, where they're giving credit to, uh, to guitarists that, uh, and just gross inaccuracies. Uh, also, the book is very salacious, um, and uh, I, don't, I don't really think that's necessary. I mean, this just didn't seem like a, a, a tell-all, and uh, yeah, really, really disappointed in this book. And so if you're curious about Merle Haggard, I suggest you check out uh, David Cantwell's The Running Kind, and I'll uh, post a little picture of it right here. It is much better written, and they did fact checking on it, unlike this. And um, it's a it's a good book, and he it has a, a revised edition, and I would I would pick that up because uh, I think the book was originally written before Merle had passed away, and so the revised edition includes, of course, uh, further info. All right. Well, thank you guys. I hope you enjoyed today's episode about uh, the ghost stories of uh, vintage guitars and celebrity connections. And I hope you guys will be wary of those things. Also, I need to check, uh, I need to thank Glazer Instruments, Glazer Bender, and Music City Bridge. Thank you so much for your support and help. And thank you guys. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.